and we sponsor these talks about three or four times per year. They're called Coyle Fisher Talks because of a, an alumnus who provides the funding for us to be able to sponsor this. So it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you this afternoon, and I want to tell you a little bit about our, our guest speaker. So, um, oh, I thought maybe they're putting something funny up there behind me, like, you know, rabbit ears. So, uh, uh, Mark Brown is Ireland's first chair in digital learning and the director of the National Institute for Digital Learning. And prior to this, he was at uh, New Zealand, uh, as you probably can tell by his accent, for those of you who are in the program, at Massey University. I first met Mark probably about six years ago. We worked on a joint authorship of a course together, and ever since then I've wanted to get him in as a faculty member. Um, sadly, this is his last year of being an IELOL faculty member, and so we thought that would be a good year to grab Mark and ask him for his insights about sort of the global space of online learning. So with that, Mark, if I can turn it over to you. Please welcome Mark Brown. Thank you very much, Larry. I want to start with a confession. While well, I'm uh, honored to have been invited to give this very prestigious lecture, particularly in light of the company that I follow, and somewhat humbled by Larry's introduction, I'm a bit of a fraud. In fact, my wife, Denise, would tell you that I'm really a fool. And so I want to start with the wise words, or the words of the wise one, Obi Kenobi. <laughs> Who's more foolish? The fool or the fool who follows? On that kind of cautionary note, I want you to just take note that you should not believe anything that I've got to say. <laughs> but more bluntly, quite frankly, watch out for the BS. In particular, there will be a number of unsubstantiated generalizations. All generalizations are dangerous, including that one. So I guess with that health warning, um, I also want to let you know right up front that I've got very few written notes. And I actually just scrolled this together half an hour ago. Um, I haven't really got a script. And to quote David Bowie, I don't really know where I'm going. But I hope I can promise that it's not going to be boring. As you can probably already see, I've drawn on two sources of inspiration for this keynote presentation. Firstly, I've been inspired by my good mate, a good down under term, Andrew Sheens. Is Andrew here? He's not playing hooky. Good. I've been inspired by my good mate Andrew Sheen's passion, fanatical, I guess, or probably unhealthy obsession with Star Wars. <laughs> Secondly, when Larry asked me to give this presentation, I was actually on a flight to Phoenix, and I um, acted really quickly when I got the email at the airport, and I tapped away with the abstract on the phone, on my iPhone, on this flight. And I was listening to some music, and suddenly I heard the song Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. And David Bowie had only just recently passed by. So untimely, I must add. So what I'm going to try to do in a somewhat risky and untested way is a juxtaposition throughout the presentation between the work of Bowie and the classics of Star Wars. So let's see how that works <laughs> on that note. So, 1980. Where were you? I need you to stand up. If you've got a laptop, you've just got to put it to one side. Stand up. We're going to have a little post-afternoon test to some degree. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And um, depending on your answer, you might be allowed to sit down. So, in 1980, had you completed your first degree? You had? Sit down. If you had, by 1980. 
No, no, no. Degree level. University. Okay, we've still got some standing up. Next question. In 1980, sit down if you had graduated high school by that stage. Whoa, we've still got some in the room standing up. Okay, one more question. Sit down if you had completed elementary school by 1980. Oh my God, I'm feeling old. <laughs> Very old. Okay, these people have an option right now. You only get one chance at it. Because, to be quite frank, you may not be old enough for what's to come. And if you feel you could be offended, now's the time to leave. Otherwise, you can sit down. Let's just refresh our memories for those who were sitting down before the others um, had that chance, because they won't know this. But in 1980, John Lennon had been assassinated. Remember that, some of you? What else happened in 1980? Ronald Reagan was elected. Doesn't this make you feel old, those of us who answered those questions? And 1980, Pac-Man was first released. Any Pac-Man addicts here? Handful. In my case, in 1980, I had just left school, as you saw. But just prior to then was 1978, to be accurate, the release of the Star Wars or Space Invaders calculator. Anyone remember this? This is at the source of the reason why I failed mathematics at school. Because I sat there for many hours trying to clock it as the little numbers went across and you had to press the number to zap it. I did clock it. 1980, uh, 1978 that was, probably spent two years before I clocked it. So here I am, <laughs> 19, 1980, my final year of school, well 79 to 80 to be honest, and then when I left, this is what I had at the core of my youth. Super monsters and scary creeps. The track from Bowie that was released in that iconic year. Just for those who don't have this history, let me just refresh your memories. So on that note, I guess I should actually say something that's worth saying. So what I'm going to do in the time available, if I get enough time, is cover three things. I want to address the scary monsters of our field. And there are quite a number of them. Secondly, I want to address, and remember I'm an eagle, so there are no handy hints for teachers in this or instructors in this talk. I want to address some of the competing forces at work at a macro level. And lastly, I want to re-envisage, re-envisage, re-envision the future, our preferred future, to get you thinking about what kind of future we might want to create as educators. There's one message, I suppose, from what I've already shared with you and some historical kind of artifacts and a couple of others to come. The future is not what it used to be. I grew up in a small country, small country village in New Zealand. I had no television, no radio until about the age of 14. Here I am. And how could I ever have envisaged that I would be standing here talking to you today. Is that not testament of the power of education? For those who don't know, I introduced myself to others earlier in the day, I didn't start university until the age of 25. Here I am, my country school, no more than 100, I think about 75 pupils, 75 students at the school. I'm five sitting there, as some of you can see. Hopefully I'm not standing in front of the screen for you. In New Zealand, there's really only one sport that's played. It's kind of not quite accurate anymore, but in my day it was a game called rugby. Kind of like American football, but without all that other stuff that you have to wear. I sucked at rugby. Absolutely sucked. I was the drawback. There are forwards and there are backs. So I was a back, but I was a drawback. But at this... Uh, game um, that I sucked at, I still have memories of my very first award and education has helped me to win several others since, but this is the one I remember most. You see, 
hopefully you can see this. This is the Principal's Award, 1974. What do you give someone when you can't think of anything else? General helpfulness. There's another little twist to this, though. If you look carefully at the signature, you might see the name Brown. And that man standing on the one side is my father. So it kind of was a bit of insider trading. But I guess the serious note here is if we were to roll on the time dial, the period from 1974 to the future, how can we imagine what life will be like? Because I certainly had no conception back in that time. So without any further ado, let's get started. The scary monsters. Three questions. Who are the monsters? Where can they be found? And what nightmare stories are they telling us? And should we believe them, I guess, as well? So that last comment might be applicable here, and I promise that I will say nothing about what is going on in the US at the moment. I just wanted to put that on the public record. These are not the scary monsters or super creeps, I guess. <laughs> on the other hand, then, <laughs> these two could be. Why? Let's look at it for a minute. You know, a picture says a thousand words, does it not? What we've got here is for profit and public. You can just see this tension there, can't you? Maybe a little too sensitive, but men shouldn't feel like this at all these days. But let's not beat around the bush. One of the dirty little secrets of our field is that, and I don't intend to offend anyone here, but our field is still dominated by men in leadership roles who are making the decisions. Now, things are changing. Most definitely not. That's not the case in Ireland. There's a serious issue. So I guess there's another element there to play with. Of course, we shouldn't worry too much because this comes from my good mate Andrew Sheen's office. I tell him he did not tell a lie for those who know him with um, uh, his saviour, if you like, his mentor. Probably on a more serious note, what I want to say, I'm not sure this comment has come up yet for those of you involved in the program, but culture eats strategy for lunch. And what I want to say here is the scary monsters are actually all amongst us. They're woven throughout the, the culture, the fabric of the work we do. And I'm going to give you a framework to kind of just, it's a, it's a populist framework. And remember those cautionary notes I began with. So I want to introduce just four kind of world views that make up, and there'll be others, the culture that we work within in our own organization. And as I'm introducing them, think about particular people. They might come to mind quite instantly that you recognize. So the first group I'm going to call the boosters. These are kind of the people that think somehow this technology is going to transform the world and transform education and lead to a better future. They kind of have this inherent technocentric perspective. I've got one that reports to me, and he has a classic saying. Mark, I hope you know. Um, it's not about the technology, it's about the pedagogy. And of course, there are lots of forms of pedagogy. But that's kind of the excuse to say, I'm not being led by technology. So there may even be some boosters amongst us. Boosters, you know, they keep us pushing us forward, but with a very strong technocentric view. Then we've got this group that I'm going to call the de-schoolers. These are the ones who want to be radical and transform the system and think that technology is going to break down the ivory towers, that they're somehow going to be transformative, or shall we use the more popular term at the moment, disruptive. And they have this libertarian perspective, um, which I won't elaborate on at this time, but I'll sort of come on to later on in the talk. But if, in a loose sense, I was to cluster these views within the, our organizations, they come with this technocratic dream, or to put more academic language on it, have a more technologically deterministic view of the world. Somehow technology is driving change and it operates outside of society. It's driving change to society. There's no sense in which society actually drives the technology. 
So let's contrast that with the demons. The doomsters. My hunch is we probably don't have any doomsters here, but I can think of a few in my organization. Why should I have to teach any differently? I've always taught this way. The lecture is very effective. It's efficient. Why should I do anything differently? Show me the evidence. So those are the um, doomsters of this kind of demon perspective, who also are fearful that somehow their jobs might be at risk and therefore resist change as well. It's quite a deep perspective. Arguably the group that's largest in education in our organizations are those who say, it's just a tool and it's how you use it that makes a difference. That's what's important. Actually, that's a dangerous perspective. And perhaps many of you have that perspective. I had that perspective once. It's the pedagogy that matters, not the tool. Actually, the tool makes a big difference. The iPhone that I have here, that technology, not how I used it, the technology itself changed my life. It shaped how I could use it. So um, this uh, toolster perspective, this human-centric perspective, and I have a lot of time for this human-centric perspective, um, can be very risky. And so I guess to contrast the technological, technocratic or um, technological sort of green perspective, we've got this group who loosely see this from more of a socially deterministic view, that it's society that changes and drives change and technology just serves the needs of society, not seeing that technology actually does shape society. We are shaped by technology and we shape the technology itself. And that's why I take exception, and it's probably the only time I take exception to this quote from Noam Chomsky, who um, I will just sort of paraphrase, says um, that technology is basically neutral. It's like the hammer. It's how you use the hammer that's important. In many respects, it's exactly the same. And now I'm on political grounds in the US, that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, there are inherent traits and attributes and designs within the technology that are predisposed for certain uses. So I think that's a quite risky perspective. So the position that I place myself, and the one I guess I'm arguing for all of you, is to be one of critic. The critic needs to look at all of these perspectives and understand what works, what doesn't, the advantages, the pros, the weaknesses, and the strengths. And I've lived my academic career for more than 25 years now with one liner, a one liner, and it's this. The light comes through the cracks. I guess I'm in a leadership role, but I'm still an academic. And when I'm sitting around a meeting, just as some of you were hearing about doing pitches to senior uh, representatives of your universities or colleges, I'm always looking for the cracks. For me, real light comes through the cracks real advancement, and I'm sad to see, not just as academics, as scholars, too often we try to cover the cracks, and we're scared of exposing those cracks, but too often our curriculum for our students is doing the same. Do remember, I warned you about the generalizations. And so I guess picking up on my comment about feeling a fraud, but probably more specifically a fool, the whole problem with the world is that when you take this critical perspective, it's actually quite challenging because it's almost paralyzing when you're always looking for the light in the cracks and you're always looking for the cracks. How do you actually do something? And in some respects, on a personal note, and I don't think um, this has come up um, in the I-E-L-O-L, -L, -E it's so hard to say, um, the imposter syndrome. I still suffer from this on a daily basis. I told you at the outset that I'm a fraud. The day that I start believing that I'm not a fraud will be the day I should get out, constantly questioning whether this is what I should be doing, whether this is the right thing to do. The day I start believing in my own speak is the day I need to be very worried. But it can be very challenging. And what is reassuring when you're in a leadership role, and it took me a number of years, probably only five years ago, when I was prepared to share this with some close colleagues. You know what? 
Every single person in that room, I think there were about five or six of us, all said, same for me. They were all senior leaders. They all felt this imposter syndrome. How come it's me that found this? Why am I in this role? There are lots of people better than me. But I guess what that means is for me, not only are the monsters all around us, but the monsters are inside us. It's a great dilemma of what to do when on occasions it involves you making decisions that affect people's lives in very serious ways, including restructuring that leads to job loss. But if I want to zoom out for a minute, um, I think it was Stephanie tweeted yesterday about um, Audrey Waters' work, The Monsters of Educational Technology, her two books. The first, The Monsters of Educational Technology, which is partly another inspiration for this particular talk, and in her recent follow-up text, The Revenge of the Monsters of Educational Technology. So one would argue these are very much framed in the critical perspective. Um, and if you're not familiar with Audrey's work, um, her blog, Hack Education, makes a good read. Except I got myself into quite a bit of hot water at a conference in Edinburgh about three months ago with a few, and maybe there was a gender dimension, I'm not sure, when I said to a couple of young women doing their PhDs, when we started talking about need to be critical, that I wasn't really that keen on Audrey's work. And there was a time where, yes, I've read the work and I appreciate, and I do still appreciate the critique. So it was a bit of a one-liner. But the reason I'm a little bit now concerned about positioning as a critic in, I just, actually before I add on to that, introduce another critic because some of you will be aware that I use this as an example of one of the thought leaders that I follow, Neil Selwyn, who's more of a traditional scholar. Um, and I would advocate this particular article or editorial from Neil about why our field is full of BS. But Neil, just like Audrey, and why um, I appreciate on the one hand the level of critique, more so with Neil because of the depth of that critique, but they don't offer alternatives. So that was my um, throwaway line to the two young women, that in my leadership role, yes, give me the critique, but give me something that I can use. And as a leader, and I have to say that, that sits more comfortably with me now, but in light of the imposter syndrome, it's something I don't find natural to say. Um, I think that we have an obligation to lead and provide alternatives. If you're just going to provide crit critical commentary and don't, I think that's a cop-out. Of course, the latter is harder. Um, so Neil is particularly critical of our field, and this is almost very passe, I think, to use the Gartner hype cycle these days, and you've probably seen many variations of it. Neil talks about the cycle of hype, hope, and disappointment, and he's certainly not the only one. Um, and that we had a discussion about failed educational technologies, another dirty little secret of our field. Arguably, most of them fail if you follow the Gartner hype cycle. I actually have a real problem with the Gartner hype cycle. So I just wanted to share with you that because for me, this is a very deficit-oriented model. It's also very technologically deterministic because it's focused on the technology, doesn't understand all of the cultural dimensions and even the politics associated with its implementation. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that uh, the cycle is very much focused on resistance. And I um, am much more interested in resilience, digital resilience, the concept of digital resilience. So my own thinking as a leader and the impact that technologies have I don't dismiss the value of the Gartner hype cycle at one level, but the concept of digital resilience talks about how there's always a legacy and how the organizational culture in which a technology comes into. And remember, an ecology is made up of a complex array of interactions, that there is a change. You've introduced something new. But how the response might be will be very different for different organizations. And so this line of thinking, drawing on the work of Martin Weller and Terry Anderson, talks about how um, the core identity of the organization, in this case Penn State, where we're based here, hosted, 
um, has cha hasn't changed in terms of its core mission. It might have just evolved slowly because, of course, if it doesn't change in an ecology and the circumstances change greatly, you become extinct as a species. But it has taken on the affordances of many of the technologies. But they're so woven into the fabric of the ecology, you just don't see them. So for me, this is a much deeper level of understanding about change. And I guess change and culture are the two things that I'm really amplifying here in thinking about the monsters. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Crofter's work and out of the business sort of area, um, how a staged model of change. It's often used in leadership training, particularly in MBA type programs. The sequence where you need to, if you wanted to get action, and maybe some lessons for some of you here, create a sense of urgency. Um, build the, the right team of people together, develop the vision. And I'll just stop there for a minute. So one of the key elements here is vision. And we hear a lot about the importance of vision. And then ultimately, as you go through this series of steps, and there's this, um, I guess, image conjures up, there's a linear stage approach to this. So I'm deliberately saying that tongue in cheek or a little critically. And then ultimately, you have a new culture emerge. The ecological model that I introduced doesn't see it. It's, it's just not that simple, quite frankly. And the work of um, Michael Fulham and Jeff Scott, who write on leadership, leadership in higher education, um, drawing more on this ecological sort of approach, would be very critical of um, vision right at the outset. There is a really large risk that if you set yourself with a vision, they argue that vision is what comes at the end. It's part of the conversation. It's part of the outcome. See, history has taught us, without wanting to be too sensitive again, Hitler had a vision. Highly successful for a period. Visions can be very blinding if we're not careful. So just a little cautionary note about vision, and also from this more ecological viewpoint, the need to understand that change in a complex organization is not an end point. It doesn't stop. It's a constant process of learning and unlearning for all concerned at all levels because we increasingly understand the importance of micro leaders and distributed forms of leadership, not those of us in designated positional leadership roles. So I would strongly um, encourage you to take a look at, in particular, this book on turnaround leadership for higher education. And the three phrases, or words that come out of this line of thinking, um, perhaps not in this particular book, but in other reports, is from actually a study of senior leaders in universities. Three things they all had in common in this order. Listen, link, and then lead. So that's the first part, the scary monsters. Let's move on to the competing forces, and I guess I need to reconnect for Andy's benefit. We've got the forces of light and the forces of dark, I suppose. And I will, again, work at this meta level in a somewhat simplistic or crude sense. So let me just see how this works with you. Here we have. Let me just take a moment, I'll stop talking and read this. And they're both right. They're seeing the same thing, but just seeing it differently. And so what I want to argue here is, and you'll see me come back to Einstein on a few occasions to come, it's the theories that we use that shape our observations, that help us see things or not see things. And theory is very powerful in that respect. And what I want to do in the next few slides is extend this metaphor. I'm going to use the metaphor of a telescope, if you like. Uh, we're on one of those spaceships. And what I'm going to argue, what I'm arguing, is just using one lens, is one theory or one set of theories is no longer good enough. Because the way the world is and these forces at work are much more sophisticated and complex. It's almost like we need 
double vision. We need to be able to alternate our vision or have bifocal vision. If I want to use a binary distinction, of course, it's more complex than that. But we can change the lens of the telescope and we see different things beyond and short. Um, so I'm going to have a theory that I'm going to introduce to you, and this is kind of, I guess, the, the meatiest part of what I want to talk about. I'm going to argue, firstly, that different interest groups and stakeholders are currently borrowing the same language of persuasion, of different worldviews, to justify very, very different end points or end games, to justify their own agenda. So let me share how I want to unpack this a little bit. We have the words now banded around. In fact, I have a colleague who used to call these aerosol words. Spray them around. E-learning, online learning, open learning, digital learning, technology enhanced learning, anytime, anywhere learning, learning without boundaries. Spray them around, but just like aerosol, fly spray. No substance. They might have a nice smell, but of course some people have allergies to those smells or sprays. So on the one hand, these forces at work, I'm going to call and cluster under the forces of the knowledge economy. So all of these terms are used by people with this worldview, who are seeing whether it be light or dark depends on your own perspective. They're using these terms. And this force of the knowledge economy is not new. Let's go right back to, since it's timely, Bill Clinton. Frankly, all the computers and software and internet connections in the world won't do much good if young people don't understand that access to new technology means access to the economy. It's the economy, stupid. This view is very prevalent. I'd have to say particularly in the United States. I want to juxtapose or contrast that with an opposing view. I'll call it the learning society. Some might talk about the knowledge society. This is a very noble tradition that really has its roots in continental Europe. Um, and I'm going to give you a quote here from a very recent quote from the president. Since I quoted the president or ex-president of the United States, let me quote here the current president, Michael J. Higgins of Ireland. And I'll read this one again because it's a little hard on the screen. Higher education has a crucial role to play in laying the foundations of a society that is more inclusive, participatory, and equal, the president said. The role of the university in enabling citizens to develop the tools to address the great challenges of our time, global poverty, climate change, and sustainability is vital or was vital. So that's how to, these two quotes contrast these different perspectives, the light and the dark, if you like. And the same language is used. Technology is used as a way of bringing the light or possibly bringing the dark, depending on your perspective. Except it's much more complex than that. So I'm going to outline in the next section four competing discourses, four languages of persuasion that fall under this framework. Um, there's this discourse around education and reproduction, the reproducing discourse. I don't know if you can see the, the, the bullet points I've got there, but let me just talk through and give you a sense of this. Education has always been about reproduction, in a good and a bad way. The bad way and the sad way is that we pretty much know in most Western countries that we have done a fantastic job in education of reproducing privilege from one generation to the next. A fantastic job. Not just privilege uh, socioeconomically, but through gender and other much more subtle forms. Um, in this sense, reproduction is about building human capital, um, but the human capital of the privileged. On a more positive note, reproduction of education helps with social cohesion, a society that is cohesive. Also, it's very important, and there's questions here about the role of the state in helping to reproduce culture and heritage, local culture and heritage, indigenous cultures and heritage. These are good things that reproduction do or is about. Then we have 
a discourse that I'll call the reschooling discourse. For me, this is probably the one in which technology is just absolutely woven throughout and the language that's being used. 21st century skills, technology as progress. No sense in which that technology brings good and bad. Education now increasingly seen as a commodity, a tradable commodity, a commodity for the individual, not for the collective good of the society. And this notion that through reschooling and new technologies we can increase market competition, which might lead to reduced price and better quality. This is all the language. And I should also add the language of performativity, KPIs, deliverables, and the so forth. I'll make a comment about Europe in a minute in response to that performativity type language. Here's some examples. Comes, this is from the US, 2008, but dated now, but some of you may recall the initiative, the um, P21, that was a major initiative um, with schools. Um, maybe I'll just stop talking and give you a moment to read that. I've highlighted the keywords, economy, competitiveness. You usually hear about markets, our future depends on this the future competitiveness of the country. Here's an example of technology as progress. MOOCs. Arguably no other innovation in education since I would say the post-Sputnik era had the same popular interest in the media than MOOCs. There's some lessons to be taken. Remember creating a sense of urgency was that change model. But those of us who have been associated with distance education for a long time, and I'm looking at Larry here in particular, know that a lot of what has been done is not that new. Also, we have to ask ourselves, who's doing it and why? What's the real agenda? Safer ground for me, given that many of those platforms on that last screen come out of the US and from elite universities, is an Ireland. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tata Consulting Group. That's a top Forbes 100 company. They came to Ireland about two years ago. I was engaged with these discussions. Still, We still are, I might add. And they came to Ireland. They have some historical family roots in Ireland. This is a multi-billion dollar corporate, the second largest employer in the United Kingdom outside of the public service. Somewhat ironic that an Indian company now um, owns all the steel factories, the car manufacturers, and so forth to make Ireland the world's capital of online learning to sell Irish degrees worldwide. Sell a degree as a commodity. Now, of course, globally. So there's some code language here. Lastly, and I'm sure you're familiar here with straight line, is it? Um, this idea that create increased market competition, open up the market, create new models, new business models, drive down costs because there's a crisis around student loans and, and the way in which higher education, particularly in the United States, but also down under, has been presented. So they're just some examples in this sort of general reschooling discourse, of which you're obviously picking up, that I'm not sure much really is being reschooled at all. Let's contrast that with the de-schooling. Now, I used the word de-schooling before at the individual level within the organization, um, but now I'm talking at the macro level. So some key terms here, unbundling, which I'm sure you're familiar with, opening up access, um, micro-credentials as a way of challenging the ivory tower and generating education in ways and new models, if you like, opening up new pathways, new learning pathways. So similarly, I'm going to give you just some examples of that flesh this out a little bit. But first, before I do so, who's this? Seymour Papert. Some of us are old enough to know, and I just threw this in at the last minute yesterday because Seymour Papert passed away last, last week. And Seymour Papert is well known as a de-schooler. In his seminal book in 1980, just by chance, 1980, 81, I think, um, Mindstorms, he's the from MIT, the original developer of the logo programming language, talked about schools without a curriculum. 
and how sad it was what we did to our students, our children going through this factory model. So here's an example I thought I'd use since I'm here at Penn State, an ASU example. This is de-schooling. Really? i oh, sorry. Is it really? I'd say it's um, not unbundling. It's rebundling. How is this really that different? Is this truly de-schooling what we've done in the past? On the other hand, here's an example from Canada, a very successful example if you're not familiar with the BC Campus Open Textbook Initiative. And on their website, they have a live count of how much money has been saved. And I'm familiar with some of the initiatives in states like California in open textbooks. This is, I think, much more genuinely a de-schooling initiative, an enabling, empowering initiative. Um, but then we have um, micro-credentials. And just one example, and I'm familiar with a number of institutions going down this path, and again, I hope I'm not going to offend anyone, but you could argue that the competency-based movement in the US, which is where it's really centered, also is being presented in a way that's about de-schooling, changing the model. And there's, of course, one university that's very, very well known internationally for what it's doing. Um, again, I just question to what extent that truly is de-schooling, depending upon your definition of what education is fundamentally. Taking that, though, to another level, the badging movement. This is the latest big thing, is it not? Well, there's probably some other latest big things. So let me just amplify the risks here, the scary monsters. Badging is the ultimate for the free marketeers. What's being positioned in the one hand is de-schooling, creating these badges and a marketplace of badges in which people can trade and by individual choice and the tensions at work here, that I can almost build my own curriculum, build these badges. That's the ultimate of the marketplace. But it might also be quite enabling for individuals. Um, I want to sh should I just show you a brief video to unpack that slightly with the badging movement and some of the forces here. But the last thing I'll show you is this one out of Europe at the moment where based on the um, model of the airline alliances, I'm a Star Alliance, I won't say what level, um, but I'm a Star Alliance member, so I try to um, fly with Star Alliance partners. And so this is an initiative, an idea that actually I had about five years ago, um, an initiative with a number of universities to build this international alliance where MOOCs will be given credit for the first year and in Europe, we have something called the European Credit Transfer System, which already allows credit. So we, unlike the US, we actually already have a mechanism for this to happen. So this is about whole new learning pathways. And this global alliance, like the airline alliance, is, is truly international. So all of this thinking, I guess, um, at the moment, the really big thing, not badges, is the blockchain. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. This is pretty new thinking around the blockchain. The blockchain is a technology that's at the root of the Bitcoin and it's the banking system base, is based on this. It's an absolutely guaranteed secure system where a student could have their personal data shared across institutions, across providers and be able to truly use a supermarket model of making up their degrees or qualifications from any number of providers. That can, blockchain can go even further. So have a look at this video. Your ledger account tracks everything you've ever learned in units called EduBlocks. Each EduBlock represents one hour of learning in a particular subject. Anyone can grant EduBlocks to anyone else. Yes, you can earn EduBlocks from a formal institution like a school or your workplace. But you can also earn them from individuals or informal groups like a community center or an app. The ledger makes it possible for you to get credit for learning that happens anywhere, even when you're just doing the things you love. Your profile displays all the EduBlocks you've earned. 
Employers can use this information to offer you a job or a gig that matches your skills. We'll keep track of all the income your skills generate and use that data to provide feedback on your courses. When choosing a subject to study in the future, you may wish to choose the subject whose students are earning the most income. You can also use the ledger to find investors in your education. Since the ledger is already tracking income earned from each edu block, you can offer investors a percentage of your future income in exchange for free learning hours. Our smart contracts make these agreements easy to manage and administer. The ledger is built on blockchain, the same technology. I'll stop on that note. Um, of course, given my background, who would have invested in me when I was uh, dancing to the beat of scary monsters? But an interesting concept. And this thinking exists. And the technology is there to make it happen, should we wish to. So I guess um, wrapping up this sort of section, I've just got a couple of slides to go, one eye on the time. There are scary monsters all around us. There are powerful forces at work here. And in many respects, um, what we have to do is work across all of these competing discourses as leaders. It's not possible to just operate within one. Whilst I have personally a position that is more located in what I'm calling the reconceptualizing, the reconceptualist discourse, it's just not possible not to collaborate with the enemy in affecting the kind of change that we might want. So this is not a polarized argument, hence why the bifocal double vision that's required, which is a unique trait for leaders to have. Just to explain the reconceptualist discourse, which is about inherently promoting the socially just society, the concept the honourable, time-honoured concept of lifelong learning, not the populist version we talk about today. Drawing on the UNESCO pillars of learning, which were first proposed probably 50 years ago now, the pillars of learning, if you're not familiar with them, learning to be, learning to know, learning to do, and the most important pillar when they were first proposed, learning to live together. Those were what were proposed as the sum of what education is about. I happen to personally add a fifth pillar, a core pillar, which is learning to change and transform. Because if we just reproduce what we've had, we won't enhance or improve. Um, and if I really want to position myself, and sadly, where I travel, and I do get to travel, it's a privilege to travel all around the world, I very rarely come across institutions that are talking about strategically the way in which they're positioning the future and the role that technology can play with what we all signed up to last year. Every country, every Western country pretty much, I can't give you the total number of countries, signed up to the new, the new millennium or post-millennium goals. And education is one of those core goals, the goal to ensure inclusive and quality education for all, promoting lifelong learning. And some of the statistics are quite scary about uh, our failure to reach the millennium goals that were set, one statistic. We could have provided every person in the world with basic schooling with 1%, what by the year 2000, we could have reached that millennium goal with the investment of 1% of what's spent on military weapons in the world in one year. So for me, um, I know there's an element of me standing as slightly on my soapbox here, but if not you as a leader, then who's going to help us make a more evenly distributed future? And so for me, what that raises is the importance of really understanding at the bigger picture, bird's eye view, what it is and where you want to go. On the other hand, maybe I've completely um, bombarded you with theory and, and a model that doesn't match your kind of representation of reality, seeing some nods, it's getting late in the day. So again, drawing on Einstein, if you can't explain it simply enough, you haven't done a good enough job. So let me just make it in a binary distinction what I think the forces are about, that we have a role, an agency to work at. At the moment, what I see is that we're hearing the language of disruption, of crisis, that education is in change and that we need to respond. I prefer to shift that language, that deficit language, language presented by others 
for other purposes often to the language of education for change. What is the change that we seek in the world? In our own organisations, if we want to take it to that micro or meso level. So we're one hour on the clock. I haven't got too long to go for this last section. And I've really given a segue already. The future's not something that we enter. It's something that we create. For me, that's about me as a leader being able to affect change, which is why I'm again weary of those who just provide the critique. We have to offer alternatives. We have to use our agency for the kind of change that we believe in. At this point, I need you to stand up because you have been sitting for a while. Now, this is, we'll see how good late in the day you are following instructions. You have to be very careful for the person in front of you or behind you with this. And I appreciate if you had a laptop, you just have to put that to one side. With your right hand, all right, right hand, put it in front of your eyes, close your eyes so you're not able to see, and now with your left hand, I want you to point, no opening eyes, I can see, and those people online, we have a camera watching you right now. You should be standing up. I can see some of you sitting down. I want you with your left hand to point to east. Point to east. Come on, hands out, point to east. All right, make it very clear, don't be shy, you're a leader. Now, keep your hand out and take the hand in front of you, keep pointing and take the hand in front of your eyes and look around where people are pointing. You may sit down. So we have a very highly educated group here in this audience and part online and we can't agree which direction is east. Gosh, I'm sort of now a little deflated. I guess my point here is, what direction do you want to go and take your organisation? It's really important. I have a strong sense of direction, maybe too strong a direction. Um, maybe my eagle vision only looks one way. But I think the importance of having a moral compass, and I'm not reusing the word moral here in any religious sense, is very important as a leader. An ethical and moral compass. Some statistics. The social commentator, um, John Pilger, some of you may be familiar with his work, it's British so it may not penetrate the US, claims, it's a slightly old quote now, Empirically, I'm always a little wary of its accuracy, but despite the huge advancements in technology over the last 50 years in my life where I had no television, no radio, despite those advancements, the wealth gap between the developed and developing countries has more than doubled. This is more empirically secure or accurate. Um, from the uh, World Bank Group, the report earlier in the year on the access to the internet around the world. Less than 50% of the world's population have access to the internet, let alone fast access. Let's not fool ourselves of the world that we live within and the problems as a result and why education matters so much. Here's this very interesting um, study that's done on a semi-regular basis by Pew Research. They do this survey between the difference between European values and American, United States values. I'm just picking out one question. It's a survey, so let's be a bit cautious. But what you can see in asking the question, which is more important, nobody in need or freedom to pursue life's goals? I feel kind of somewhat privileged because I have a, a foot in many different viewpoints and experience different cultures but this is a very fundamental issue for us to address around education and what we want. So I suppose what I would like to challenge you and you're thinking about new technologies in education is to be asking yourself the question what type of education system do we want the use of new technologies to serve? Perhaps more importantly what type of society do we want the use of new technologies to serve? Pragmatically, 
if you are familiar with the Commonwealth of Learning, if you're not, it's well worth um, looking up their website. John Daniel, so John Daniel, who was their previous CEO, president, previously president of the um, Open University in the United Kingdom, makes it very obvious that we will not be able to meet the growing demand for higher education by building more institutions. So online or blended or some variation has to be part of the solution, just quite pragmatically to meet the growing demand. Notably, if we quote the um, Allen and Seaman report, the most recent one, and this was mentioned by um, in one of the presentations earlier um, today, that um, I think the figure for Penn State might be double this, but the figure for the United States based on this survey of institutions is only 2% of the current registrations or enrollments who are in online pro programs live outside of the US. That's so tiny. So I want to, and I am watching the time, and i got five minutes to, to good. I was just going to give you three very simple, uh, not simple, very three very simple tasters as cases of what I've tried to do with my moral compass and those who I work with to address some of these grand challenges. Three cases. The first one, as Larry introduced, I've come from New Zealand. I moved to Ireland about three years ago. New Zealand is at the bottom of the world, has no military air force whatsoever, and it's a very pacifist, peace-loving country relatively anti-US as well, unlike Australia, um, for reasons I won't explain here. Um, so my role, um, and the university that I was with had three campuses, 20,000 campus-based students, 20,000 online students, and an increasing number worldwide of New Zealand residents or citizens. So I was challenged by the president of the university to grow the worldwide part of the operation, but with a mission the institutional mission was to take what's special about New Zealand to the world. What's special about the different way of thinking, that was the mission. As a colonised country, the last thing we wanted to do was take a Western form of education down a pipe and deliver it to the developing world. So um, ultimately, I won't go into detail, I'm happy to talk it, uh, with you individually about what ended up being the launch of a brand called Massey University Worldwide. We paid a lot of money for that um, and a lot of discussion went into it. This was not individual courses, individual units or modules being available, but programs targeting particular regions, working in partnership with aid agencies. The most significant was with the World Bank providing two master's degrees, one in public health and one in veterinary medicine in the field of epidemiology right throughout Southeast Asia several million, about four and a half million from the World Bank um, at the time in the SARS epidemic. So there was a strong sense of moral purpose and fundamentally this was about building capacity and capability locally and working with partners to build their capacity. I don't have time to go any further, um, but we had programs all around the world with that different narrative. That narrative, as distinct from selling degrees online, is much more well responded to, if you like. Then I want to draw on, some of you will be familiar here with Craig, um, this piece was published earlier in the year, The Death of Online Learning. When I went to Dublin, when I went to Dublin City University, I kind of worked for the university but I also have a national role, so I'm conscious who pays my salary. We um, have an online operation and the operation really was in serious need of rebranding. So I guess the lesson I want to give you here, building on this thinking of how we'd like to think we're ahead of the curve, is we did not want to use the word online. You see, some years ago we would have been talking e-learning. That's pretty passe now, you don't even hear anyone talk about e-business anymore. So after a short period of consultation and deep thinking, what we wanted to do is move away from online because firstly that term is going to disappear. Um, will we really be seriously thinking, talking the word online in five years? Do we brand Penn State campus or Penn State face-to-face -face versus online? That's a delivery mode. Inherently that's institutionally centric. So the brand that we ended up with, and I don't have long enough to really flesh out these um, little cases, 
is DCU connected. Being connected wherever you are. Let me give you an example um, of what we did. All in a very short space, but deep thinking about the importance of being learner-centric, or perhaps learning-centric. And online is just a delivery mode. It's not the actual experience that we were trying to promote. Here's what the experience is. My name is Patrice Brennan, and I did a BA in Humanities with DCU. I love living in the country. I love the quiet. I love the isolation of it. But that hasn't hindered me returning to education, and that's what I love about DCU, that I'm not, I'm not restricted and I'm not limited by where I live. My lifestyle is, is actually very busy. I work full time and I've got three young children, so I needed to find a course and an option that fitted in with both work and my children. The online learning platform in DCU gave me the flexibility to be able to connect with my tutors and also with my peers. I used to study mainly in my own sitting room with my laptop on my lap. Difficult enough, but I found myself being very comfortable in my own surroundings, in my own sitting room. It's where I felt relaxed. I do retreat to our study, which is actually a radio room. My husband is very much into amateur radio. When I'm studying, I can hear this constant Morse code in the background, which I've become so accustomed to now that I find I need it, almost need it, to study. As a family, we've become more open, more questioning. And even my children, which I love to see, my children question everything. That has all come from my education, educating them. DCU has changed my life without a doubt. Um, I have more confidence and more self-assured. DCU Connected has opened every door for me. So I won't linger on that other than say there's a very raw, authentic, authentic element that comes through that. I'm going to skip through that next slide. Last example. MOOCs are huge in Europe. MOOCs in the US, people pass out. Bad, bubble burst. That's what I hear in my network. Here's a survey that I'm involved in, which uses the same uh, survey, the Babson study, if you like, that's used annually, that's looking at MOOCs in Europe. And you can see here the drivers, not so much the drivers, sorry, the intent to offer MOOCs is far higher than in Europe than the US. And some of the other data from the study shows us there are very different drivers, very different drivers. Because in continental Europe, Countries like Germany and France, education is free. If you like contrasting the forces of the learning society with those of the knowledge economy, the learning society sees education as inherently a public good. So um, last week I was very, very busy when I was trying to put these slides together and do a few other things because we're about to embark on the launch of our new MOOC initiative at DCU with a brand new MOOC platform. Why would we do that? Well, for reasons that are very different from most institutions. For those of you who happen to use Moodle, um, this is a MOOC platform that Moodle HQ have been building for the last 12 months. It's a dedicated platform. It's not Moodle. It's got Moodle Core, but it's a completely different um, platform where they're going to be the first university in the world to use it because we want to be a future maker not a future taker, not a client of someone else's thinking, but to shape the future, to see where this might go. And the number one driver for this initiative, um, and we have our first MOOC starting next week, which is for online learners, prospective online learners, to learn how to be online learners and to choose whether to study. The number one driver is not profile, not branding, innovation to create the third space for innovation where we can try things, do things differently, to be at the cutting edge in a way that we're not risking those who are um, serious students who have paid, if you like, for their course offerings. That's the reason. Happy to talk about that at other times. So coming to the end, um, my leadership role, and of course what I've just shared with you, I'm only one of many that have been involved in these initiatives. So I've certainly had, in all three of those cases, had to do pitches to senior executives, to the presidents of the universities, to win their hearts and minds to get the support. But ultimately, a really important ethos around leadership for me, and a sign of that, is that leadership is a function of producing more leaders, not followers. And it's very important. 
sustainability and succession planning has been built into my role from day one. I'm not in Ireland forever. So in conclusion, let me wrap up. Three things. Agency and leadership. In the first part, I talked about the scary monsters. If you want to give up or put your head under the blankets to the scary monsters, then I really don't think you should be in this room. Being a leader is taking that leadership and the agency that it brings to change things and make them better. Of course, that requires you to actually collaborate with the enemy. This is not a competition. You actually have to convince the enemy. There I say it. That, and that's quite possible. In the three cases that I've used, there were enemies amongst the, the team. You have to work with them and convince them that your views are the views that the institution, if you like, or the state needs to be following. And lastly, I use the word being a future maker as distinct from a future taker. What sort of institution are you? What's your DNA? What's core to your DNA? I'm pleased that I've chosen to be in institutions that see themselves as future makers. And so you have to have that courage. So when I grew up in a small country village, I guess someone instilled in me, in my education, a sense of agency, purpose, and that I could be a change maker. That's the most powerful thing that we can do in education for the people whom we have responsibility to address some of the big, big challenges we face. And the one thing I'd have to say that really concerns me when we are talking about online or what any, any terms that I used previously is we're not talking enough about the big ideas. Online seems to be the big idea, the technology. We need to move beyond that. So to wrap up, I have one final slide. I just want to use Einstein. Um, in a brief video, just a very brief one, to remind us that also, and my example of the opportunity that we're embarking on with this new MOOC platform, is we want to do things differently, not the way they've been done before with the other platforms. Our second MOOC, I might add, is on the Irish language, very symbolic for us. So thank you very much. Um, I happen to think we have all the change makers here, the crazy ones in this room. <laughs> um, I think I may have left some time for questions. I'm very yeah, conscious yeah, yeah. of having gone over time. Um, you, but Mark. I'm always happy to talk individually if we um, have to wrap up soon. So um, from the last couple of days, well, yeah, it was two days. Yeah, we just started yesterday. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of the concepts that Mark has been has presented and summarized for us in, in such an eloquent way. Thank you, Mark. What kind of questions do you have about um, your role, your position, how we view this space moving forward? What would you say is your most fundamental insight as you try to lead people in education and working with them? Like, what do you try? You know, it was all about mm -hmm. leaders creating leaders. Mm -hmm. What is the most important thing in working toward that vision with educators for you in a leadership position? So the first thing that sprung to mind in the first part of your question, it just came to the forefront of my head, which is usually the best answer, is you have to win hearts and minds. This is about change. And if you don't win hearts and minds, and if change is imposed from the top, or if the hearts and minds are at the bottom but are disconnected from the top, so I like to talk about middle out. Many of us are in middle leadership roles. Middle out is just as important as top down and bottom up, but ultimately this is about change. And if you haven't won the hearts and minds, for me, you're doomed to fail. Can't win everyone though, not those doomsters. <laughs> so I'm wondering kind of how, well, so there's some evidence of from Purdue University and the Gallup poll teamed up and they did this huge survey of graduate, college graduates and found that the biggest thing was connection with faculty and people. The biggest thing that people took away from their college experience, uh, which I'm, a, I'm speaking from the faculty perspective, we know it's the interaction with the students that that's the transformative thing. So how do you see that? you know, online or, you know, these distributed learning, how that, how we can preserve that 
elements and what new structures can we do to take the place of that people just happening to spend time together in the hallway or that because sometimes you know the faculty what people will remember is what could have been just a passing comment it's usually not the formal things it's the informal interactions what are we what's going to take the place of that so I have two sort of immediate responses that come to mind and they operate at two levels. The first is our online learners are not the same typically as our campus-based students have left school. They, they, they've they got other things in their lives. Um, now that is changing. There's evidence to show the, the age group is getting younger and younger. But there's plenty of evidence through the way social networks are used um, that people can be very connected online. And I think we've just got to learn one of the reasons why MOOCs, in my opinion, are a very valuable initiative. They're part of the solution for bringing education to the rest of the world. We just need to learn from them. Um, so I, I don't see that as impossible at all. I think we've got evidence. People somehow get addicted to be in these networks. But probably the answer that I'm more attracted to is in, and I absolutely agree with your first comment about the network, the power of the network. This is a network here. This is the single most valuable thing that this cohort has and the cohorts that have come before you and afterwards. This is an exercise of change making. Your job and the agency you need to take is to make sure you get that network to the best of your ability whilst you're here and afterwards. Because you're all going to follow careers that will go off and on into different positions of responsibility and it's fantastic having that network. The single most valuable thing for me and my privilege of being able to travel internationally is I have an incredible network. It's like gold to me. So oh, that's a challenge to you and it's really also uh, I think a validation and a celebration of just how valuable this is, this experience. Mm -hmm. And a credit to Larry and the team I have to say. Hi Mark. Hi Mark, I have a question. I don't know if it's working. Great. Um, how do you First of all, the new MOOC platform looks great. Congratulations. What a what an accomplishment. How do you rationalize um, some of your last statements on access to ed education as being almost a basic human right um, versus, say, um, the astronomical cost mm -hmm. today, especially in the US, mm -hmm. for a bachelor's degree? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of curious so, if your thoughts on that. Two comments. I'll just a little segue on the MOOC one because I really didn't do those justice. I might pick up on some of them on Thursday, depending if you're interested. Um, what's really important about the MOOC initiative and Moodle, and I know Canvas is probably the LMS that's now got the greatest traction, is Moodle has language packs for just about every language in the world. 75% of all MOOCs being offered currently, if you believe a report out in February, are being offered in English. This is not a form of cultural imperialism. I don't know what is it. And so in Europe, this is a very big issue. It's one of the reasons why so many of my European continental, European continental colleagues haven't lost any sleep over the decision for the UK to leave Europe or the European Union because they've never really embraced multilingual and a diverse sort of sense of culture. Um, so um, our reason to be in mood on the comment I made about the Irish language, this is deeply symbolic for us. Where Ireland is part of Europe, and we therefore want to embrace language and culture. Coming back then to the second part of your question, um, so for me, that last section I talked about our preferred futures. Our politicians have got a lot, our policy makers, but we have to do this as well, because you can't leave them, you know, to make their decisions. The fundamental issue we're faced with is who pays, we all understand that education matters and we are committed to education. In fact, you know, if we're not committed, the issues that the world faces, unsustainable population growth, the inability to feed the planet, climate change, the conflict that's going on, education has to be one of the major solutions to that. So we all agree education is crucial, I hope. So then the question is, who pays for it? So what we have is different models. In the US, in Australia, in New Zealand increasingly, that is the private individual. Education as the knowledge economy is part of a personal benefit and therefore the individual who gets the benefit pays for it. In New Zealand, a quick one-liner, 
the third largest export income earner for the country now is education. That's how big education has become as a business. Where I live, and in continental Europe, UK is a complete exception, they're in the similar league to the US, education is seen as a basic public good. That the benefit is not just for the individual, but for society at large. Hence why the policy level decision is the state largely pays for it. So minimal fees in Ireland, um, that's a challenge for us in the financial situation that Ireland's in. But the downside, depending on your perspective, is we pay very high taxes for that. So that's a kind of fundamental issue that we have to grapple with. But let's also challenge ourselves to get outside of our national boundaries, which is what I'll try to do on Thursday for those of you who are coming along, because the challenges we face are not just restricted in today's globally connected world. But this is an issue that if we don't address, and of course I'm familiar with the debt level in the US for students, this is unsustainable. So, Wendy? Love your presentation, Mark. Thank you. I was watching the Olympics the other day, and they had the bike race, and it was a competition. I mean, these guys were going as hard as they could for 150 miles. Sometimes they'd go over cobblestone, their bikes would break down, they kept going, right? Sometimes one was in front, and the others followed, and then the other one would come in front, and the others would follow. And it goes back to that comment about all of us needing to lead, but it also goes to that idea of sometimes we're the learner, sometimes we're the teacher, sometimes we're the leader, sometimes we're the follower. But even when we're competing, there's a collaboration that goes on. Everybody has that common goal and one guy will pass that finish line first. But that whole path, that whole way, it's really a collaboration. It's a teamwork. And that model resonates with me when I think about where we need to go as educators. I'm with a for-profit. We're pretty competitive. But what's real clear to me is that we need to work together. We need to collaborate. We need to pull our minds together. It takes a village. And I would like your comments on that, because I saw a lot about leadership. And I just want your thoughts on collaboration. So the one way I could connect into that is using an ecological metaphor, despite what commonly is thought around evolutionary theory. The species that actually survive are those that collaborate and compete, but collaborate. Um, so the collaboration absolutely is crucial. Um, and I, the bike example resonates with me because we had a son who was a professional cyclist in Europe for a few years, but also the best example you often see in leadership development programs are the Canadian geese. And there are some great, you, search YouTube, Canadian geese leadership. So the, the geese are able to fly and be 30% or I think it might even be more efficient by that collaboration. And that's the distributed leadership, the sharing, not always being at the front. Um, this I'm going to share with you as a personal story for me because I've taken a really, well, it was quite symbolic for me, quite meaningful only in the last 24 hours. It sounds a little egotistical, but it's a sign that something is about the culture I'm working in is starting to be where I would like it to be. So um, I just had one of those really good flights over from Dublin. It's, I went to Chicago, so I think it was around seven hours. And I managed to write a conference paper, a collaborative conference paper on the plane. It was just a short paper, about 3,000 words. And I had bits and pieces already there, so don't think I just rattled it off like that. But it's one of those occasions where it all just fitted together. And I was probably half a day ahead of my schedule. I was really pleased with myself. Um, a group of us, of my team, about six of our team, I shouldn't say my team, are going to this conference in Australia. I'll tell you more about that on Thursday. So if you're going to go that far, they've never been there, we might as well have a few papers. So we sort of identified maybe three papers we would do. So that was one of them that I managed to do. I said to one of my colleagues on Chicago, um, and I usually don't, this is a lesson for leaders as well, I typically do not as a rule send any emails on the weekend. I write them, but I have staff with young children, uh, just know what that's like, that background noise. And we talk about this, they like to get them on a Sunday evening. But I, this was an exception because um, time zones and other things. So I said to him, I think I'm going to write another one. I think I can do it. 
and there was something else that we'd been working on that would be really good to showcase. Actually, the, the MOOC example. And I said, I'm going to challenge myself. I'll, I'll see if I can do it. You might like to think about doing the one that we've got for this other conference. This is the Eden Research Conference. And so all in all, when it came to the deadline, which was 6 a.m. on Monday, what day are we today? Wednesday, Tuesday, yesterday. I only got three and a half hours sleep on the first day because I got that paper finished at 2.30 in the morning. But just this morning, I sent an email to the team because in the end, eight papers got submitted for this conference. My name is on every single one, but on only one as the lead author. So I, I said it sounded a bit egotistical. For me, that's the sign of me not being at the front. If you use the cycling example of the Canadian geese, I don't have to be. And in fact, in my role, I don't need to prove anything. I'm unfortunate once you make your way through the, you know, up that tough layer, you're kind of then accepted, you're in the club. So I don't have to have my name at the first. So for me, that was just a sign. And planning for that, building it in. Because um, one of the things I was um, saying to the group when we were looking at the quality frameworks, the um, European e-excellence framework or benchmarking tool has a whole section on research that if you haven't got a research culture in your institution, reinvesting and you've actually planned for that, that's a big gap. And so um, I don't want to create um, people who are professional scholars. Um, I want them to be scholarly professionals. Terrific. With that, Mark, please join me once again saying thank you for, for Mark Scott.